Hello and welcome to this week's Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fospero. In November this year, Doctor Who celebrates 60 years, continuing its reign as the longest running sci-fi show ever. Former Time Lord David Tennant will step back into the TARDIS to play the 14th Doctor, Catherine Tate at his side, for three hour-long specials by Russell T. Davis. And to coincide with the Diamond anniversary, the release of Lizzie Hopley's audio novel, The Box of Terrors, narrated by Impressionist John Culshaw. John has loved Doctor Who since he was a kid and actually came up with the idea for the audio book. So it's a great place, I think, to start part two of our podcast special. John, given the fact that we're around the same age ballpark, do you reckon we were hiding behind the settee roughly at the same time? Oh, I think we would be. Yes, I think so. I was born when Patrick Troughton was the Doctor. And yes, we would have been, we would have entered the world in the Troughton era. My f- earliest memories of Doctor Who, I think I was about three years old or so. And I remember watching John Pertwee in stories like The Demons and Speared from Space. And I like John Pertwee because of that very uh, resonant voice, that he has a great, crisp, sharp resonance. And he was a very paternal, protective doctor. The aliens would appear, the threat would appear, and straight away he knew what to do. The the Inverness cloak would sort of rise up like that, and he'd react in an instant. And uh, he would protect his companions and those around him. And he was just this very paternal, warm hero. And uh, a, a lovely intro to the infinite possibilities that you get through Doctor Who. And were you like me? Did you used to hide when scary things came on? Yes, exactly. Behind the sofa or through the crack in the door. And those cliffhanger moments, which were some of the most tremendous things. They were written so beautifully to give you a, a shock and a scare. You know, when the Sontaran took its head off and the, there is this evil Mr. Potato Head staring down the camera into your living room. And this is, you're left with this thought for a week. Your imagination is there to play with that for a full week until next Saturday comes and you pick it all up again. And who'd have thought that Doctor Who would play such a seminal role in your life because you've done all sorts of things as well as the Box of Terrors, which I'll ask you about in a minute. But audio dramas, I mean, you've had a long association with Doctor Who, haven't you? Yes, I always loved the show for its sense of infinite possibility. You know, the time travel to any point in the universe, any point in time, in any planet's existence, you can go everywhere. But it always comes down to the Doctor helping just one person, his companion or someone in need of rescue on a planet. The Doctor is an old fashioned hero, always on the side of good, an extremely moral character. So it's a good thing to watch and be absorbed by. And yeah, like so many people who watched Doctor Who when they were growing up, you go on to work on it. Russell T. Davis, for example, the, the showrunner once again. Can't wait to see what new chapter he will treat us to. But yeah, he was a great, great Doctor Who fan. And now he's the showrunner. Mark Gatiss, another Pertwee child, has gone on to appear in it so many times, written so many fantastic stories. And I joined Big Finish Productions for all of their audio dramas and love doing those, playing the Brigadier, sometimes the Third Doctor, sometimes the Fourth and other characters within it all. So yes, it's a lovely universe to be adopted by. It's like a boy's dream, isn't it? To to watch that when you're growing up. I I mean, I was a Pertwee child as well and really liked him. But I also liked some of the the more modern day Doctors as well. David Tennant, I think he's making an appearance, isn't he, for the 60th anniversary as the 14th Doctor, so coming back. Did you like David in the role? I thought he was extraordinary. He was so extraordinary. I'd loved Christopher Eccleston, and I didn't want him to go. Oh, you know, because not. he was, you know, fantastic. Okay, yeah, great. You know, tell you something, Rose. You were fantastic. But you know what? So was I. And I didn't want him to go. And then he regenerated, and then there was David Tennant, and then instantly, you know, ah, oh, we're going to be all right. He just seems a Doctor Who to me. Yeah. He's got Doctor Who written all over him. Oh, completely. His speed of thought, that heroic dash. You can see the thoughts happening and the logic, just thinking like lightning. And once again, always being on the side of good. It's rather nice that he's come back. When he was the 10th Doctor, David Tennant. Now people call him David Fortinant because <laughs> he is the 14th <laughs> I never Doctor. I about that. Yeah. And what about lovely Tom Baker as well? Well, exactly. That was another similar situation. I was such a pertry child. I, I didn't want him to go. And then the regeneration happened and uh, 
There was a brigadier giving the fourth doctor all of these new costumes until they latched onto the long scarf and the fedora. What other hat could he have had? Fedora. And then once again, by that amazing story, the Pyramids of Mars, you know you're going to be all right. And that wonderful booming voice, you know, Pertwee had this sharp resonance and warmth, this sort of velvety boom of Tom Baker. I think doctors always have to have good voices. Like, there's a lovely story, actually, Sam, going on here. Dear, oh dear, Paul O'Grady's turned up. Dear, oh dear. I always do the voices I'm fond of. The way that Tom Baker's long scarf came about. Oh, I don't know that story. Yeah, when they were thinking of Tom Baker's costume for the fourth Doctor, inspiration came from, you know, the Toulouse-Lautrec poster yes. with the black coat and the and the, the red scarf. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they thought, why don't we have a why don't you have a scarf? Then you can be a bit like a sort of a university student, sort of drifting through the Academy of the Universe type of feeling. Yes, well, that would be very nice. Yes, well, I, yes, I'm very happy to have a scarf. Something I can swish as I walk along, you know. And so the producers of Doctor Who, not knowing much about knitting, I suppose, why, why should they need to know about knitting? They They're know very... about time travel. Don't they? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Knitting is a very earthly thing. So in order to be helpful, they just bought a big sack full of wool and went to someone in the costume department, a lovely lady with a wonderful name, Begonia Pope. <laughs> and they said, Begonia, we want the doctor to have a scarf. We've got you some wool. Could you knit a scarf for the doctor to wear? Oh, yes, of course. Very well, very well. And being the helpful soul that she was, she just knitted all the wool that she had been given <laughs> until it was all used up. And then a scarf the length of the M40 uh, <laughs> followed. <laughs> <laughs> you did well not to trip over on many oh, an episode, yes, yes. I, I think. Tell us about the box of terrors, because this is coming out to coincide with mm. the 60th anniversary. And it was your idea, wasn't it, the audiobook? Tell me more. Yes, it, it was. Being a fan of the third and fourth Doctors, across the history of Doctor Who, there have been times when certain Doctors have worked together, such as David Tennant and Matt Smith with John Hurt, such as John Pertwee, Patrick Troughton, William Hartnell, Peter Davison joined uh, John Pertwee, Patrick Troughton and Richard Herndl. There's been many times when doctors have worked together and you always wonder how's that going to play out? These profound, towering characters, how are they going to interact? And it's always a fascination. Two doctors that never have worked together was John Pertwee and Tom Baker. And I always was fascinated by how the third and fourth might interact and how they might work together, how they might clash, how they might cooperate. And I just remembered very casually mentioning to one of the producers at Big Finish Productions, David Richardson, what about the third and fourth? Why don't we put them together and I'll voice them and maybe have one of the big classic enemies, maybe Omega, the renegade time lord who detonated a star and created time travel, a big threat. Let's see how they get on. And I thought the idea had gone away, but just a few weeks later, David uh, emailed through and said, yeah, well, you know, we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that. We've got a, a brilliant writer, Lizzie Hopley, who's up for writing it. And we had a little chat and came up with a sort of a, a vague plot. And then Lizzie took that away, built on it and wrote all of these majestic layers of this amazing story. And it's become the Box of Terrors, where the third and fourth Doctor and their respective Sarah Jane Smiths these different eras will work together. And when you finished recording it all, mm. what did you think to the finished audiobook? Are you really happy with it? Uh, yes, I, I hope it's something that Doctor Who fans will treasure. When you put those characters together, I think it is something to treasure, the way it's been written by Lizzie. I really hope it's something to cherish. But how lovely for you to have a special part in that 60th anniversary, because as I said in the introduction, it is the longest running yeah. sci-fi programme and it's got fans all over the world. Yeah. And I think given your passion for it and your love and interest, how nice that you've got a key role in there for the 60th. I mean, that must mean a lot, I would have thought, John. <laughs> <laughs> I've made you choke now. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does. It, it really means a lot, actually. It's something I'm very proud of. I considered it a, a big responsibility. So yes, it does. it does mean a lot. So it when does. you're in the recording studio for something like that and you're spending longer in character than you are, for example, if you're doing some stand-up or some dead ringers. Mm. How different is that to get the voice right over a long period of time? Yes, you get the sense of being much more anchored into it. And when you're in a little grey room in Croydon, in front of a tablet, just scrolling the words up, you really get immersed 
into what's going on and you'll have done your preparations on it so you know who's speaking when and then some spoken dialogue comes up and all right okay this is the pertwee doctor <clears throat> so you'll just change your position and then say the pertwee lines and then go along with those until they come to the end and then there'll be another bit there'll be sarah jane smith asking a question with that great sense of urgency and then of course There'll be the, the fourth doctor just taking a different sensibility on of it over here. Yes, of course, I know, yes, but... And then, yes, you work that out. Remember, Percy, Doctor will contrast. And you build it up like that. However the previous character said a certain thing will inspire how you reply to it. And it just builds up like that. It sounds to me like after you've finished, you might need a long lie down. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. You sat down for a long time. It's sort of refreshing to stand up for a bit. Oh, I and then have the lie down. It's a bit like Eddie Izzard playing 19 characters from Great Expectations wow. in the theatre at the moment. Astonishing, you know, yes, I must see that. One-woman show. It is quite spectacular, actually. I like Eddie Izzard, and I would imagine you'd appreciate it even more. Great Expectations was my favourite mm. book, book that inspired me in English literature. So combined with the love of Eddie Izzard, yes. and then for you, all those voices switching from Miss Havisham to Pip wow. to Joe the blacksmith, all before your very eyes, she says, suddenly feeling feeling quite theatrical now that I'm sitting <laughs> yes. in a room with you. That's perfect. But, I, I mean, love we... Eddie as well, that incandescent inventiveness. Oh, it's just sparkling, Clever, sparkling. clever person, though. Yeah. He speaks lots of languages and all sorts of things. And Marathon so humble running. as well, so humble and such a nice soul. Yeah, I like Eddie a lot. Now, of course, we loved you over the years on shows like Spitting Image, which we haven't even talked about, but we will. But I was just sticking with the long-form character's thought, mm. because in recent years, you have done quite a few long form characters haven't you yeah i do love doing that it's a different rhythm uses a different part of your brain and it just allows you to stretch out with the characters and tell a story rather than be hitting the punch lines and going for the gag going for exaggeration it's nice to sort of hit nuggets of truth instead of aiming for the gag, the joke all the time. I think a really good example of this, which I've watched and liked very much, was the drama that you did, a special drama on an imagined account of David Bowie as he worked on his final album, Black Star. Yeah. What was that like to work on? Oh, it was amazing. Yes, so Bowie in the studio, the final take, that was called. It was you know, on the, the World Service, early 2018. The dates and times etch in your mind for this. I, I got a call from David Morley, the producer, a great, great David Bowie fan. And he said, could you do us a David Bowie? We, we want to do a play. We want to do it next week. And I says, well, oof, give me a bit more time than that. I wouldn't want to just roll through the door and portray David Bowie so quickly. Can you do this maybe in a, in a month and give me lots of interviews to, to listen to? Yeah, that's good. That's fine. That's fine. So I just really sort of dug down into watching lots and lots of David Bowie interviews. One of them was particularly useful called Verbatim, where he was just chatting through his inspirations through all the various chapters of his astonishing career in a very relaxed way, a very chatty way. It was just like leaning against a leather chair and having a chat late into the night. It was like listening to that. And it was just so absorbing just to get into the rhythm of how a genius such as Bowie, how the flow of ideas happens and how everything just manifests so amazingly. And it, it was so, so very inspiring. With his condition at that time, it seemed to me that this unlocked a curiosity and a defiance within him to see where that could lead him creatively. And yes, his final album, Black Star, I think was one of his most creative, one of his most inventive. He was at the top of his game doing that. And yeah, just that sense of how inventive it made him and the sense of defiance. He wasn't going to let anything stop his creativity and brilliance and incandescence thereof. So yes, it was very um, absorbing to do. Luckily, the first interview that I happened to, or the first clip that I watched, I think it just said that uh, David Bowie gives career advice. I thought, oh, what's this about? And I just pressed the button. And, you know, there he was sitting, you know, very laconically. And he said, the other thing I would say is never play to the gallery. If you feel safe in the area that you're working in, you're probably not working in the right area. Always go a little further into the water than you feel you're capable of being in. Go a little bit out of your depth. And when you feel that your feet aren't quite touching the bottom, then you're just about in the right place to do something exciting. Which was exactly how I felt approaching doing a piece like that. So I thought, thank goodness, this is the first clip that I've watched. Of all interviews available, thank goodness it was this one first. And it just sort of set the tone. 
I saw an interview actually this week with Andy Serkis talking yeah. about his friendship with Bowie. And somebody was saying, did you, you know, he loved Bowie's music. And he said, did you feel nervous being in the presence of somebody so revered and, and amazing? And he said, it was really strange. He just came across as a lovely, warm yeah bloke yeah. and that's how he comes across in the documentary that you voiced oh. very mellow and yeah. kind and humble yes that was exactly his spirit combine that with that incandescent genius and you have brilliance mixed with that lovability and relatability and that's where you get a megastar from and did you feel a bit of responsibility with that, John? Because it's very different to a lot of the laugh out loud material mm. we know you for. And it was such a tricky time in his life because, as you say, he was ill at the time, wasn't mm. he, when he was putting this album together? Yes, you do feel a great sense of responsibility. So long as the feeling runs true for you, so long as you feel that there's a sense of what you're trying to capture... And in this, the sense of Bowie being in the studio, in his natural home, where he just shone so many, many countless times, surrounded by astonishing musicians who he trusted, which would in invoke his creativity even more, with the producer, Tony Visconti, who he trusted, all of these elements surrounding him, which has brought him to his best, his natural home. The feeling of the ideas floating around, the flashes of genius, where maybe a little mistake would happen on one part of the music, and Bowie would say, "No, no, 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 that's no, we should keep that. That's that's," and he capitalised on it. He'd take the element of surprise, see where it led, and just all of these elements coming together. And I remember in the studio, Dirk Maggs, who directed it, a wonderful audio movie maker, you could describe Dirk as, and. One thing we tried at first was for me to just, you know, be sitting down in a you know, studio with darkened lights and just see if that would capture some kind of add to the, you know, laconic feel that perhaps we wanted certain moments of it. But it just made it a bit too sort of stilted. In order to portray David Bowie, you've got to stand up. You've got to have a lot of physicality. You've got to be moving around quite a lot because that sort of reflects the right kind of energy. You can't just sit down and deliver that in a placid way. You've got to be up and about and uh, really expressive to just get the right feeling. That was did you like his music too, John? Oh, every album, every single was just so completely different and surprising. And yeah, I was very lucky a few weeks ago to see Rick Wakeman. He was at a, a charity event and he sat at the piano and he just began to describe how it was to play piano on Life on Mars. It's a god-awful small affair To the girl with the mousy hair But her mummy is yelling no And her daddy has told her to go But her friend is nowhere to be seen Now she walks through her sunken dream To the seat with the clearest view and she's hooked to the silver screen But the film is a saddening bore For she's lived it ten times And he said just how, you know, you'd expect the chords to be going one way, then it would change. And then another way, it would never be the way you would expect. And it was just so endlessly surprising and uplifting and inspiring. It must be amazing to sort of almost live a little bit of that character through doing a project like that, but nothing quite like you lived Les Dawson. Oh, now, I yes. grew up <laughs> watching Les Dawson with my nan. And you know, Les Dawson did that funny, like, wriggle under the sort of boob. Oh, yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> There's some of the Lancashire housewives at the Cotton Mills. Yes. So I loved all that. But you became him, didn't you, for a tour? Yes, exactly. Through uh, yeah, 30 shows in Edinburgh and then uh, 26 shows on, on the tour. So yes, I certainly did. I lived the life of Les and once again, he, a lovely soul to inhabit. His language is lovely, lugubrious use of language and description where there will be all these beautiful, beautiful descriptions. I gazed up at the majesty of the night sky, a purple vault fretted with a myriad points of light as the stars glistened. Just like diamonds cast across black velvets, I watched in awe as the crescent moon ascended the horizon like an amber chariot across the zenith of the heavens towards the ebony void of infinite space. 
As I looked up to behold this marvellous sight, I thought to myself, you know, I really must put a roof on this lavatory. Um, <laughs> That's my favourite speech of Les's, that oh, one. Oh, fantastic. Well, he, he describes things like you do. You've got this eloquent way of bringing things to life. Have you always been able to do that? Have you always been a lover of language? And oh, yes, language? yes, I think so. Words are such wonderful tools to use. And characters who use them in this astonishing way, such as Les, Tom Baker as well. You know, you've got great descriptions with Tom Baker. Just to hear it come to life in this way. I remember one of Tom Baker's stories, just to go back to him for a moment. Yes, he was reminiscing about, uh, yes, I've always had a great admiration for the Queen, you know, so such a great sense of duty and such elegance as though she was sort of lit from within, really. And, oh, Princess Margaret, yes. If she was to kiss a frosty car bonnet, the engine would purr into life. <laughs> 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 Fantastic characters, which leads us nicely into Spitting Image, which mm. I think it was really Spitting Image in the 90s, wasn't it, that gave you certainly your television break, I'd say. Yeah. Were yes. they fun times? Oh, what a palette of characters. Yes, I, I was there at Viking Radio. That's in my part of the world. Exactly, Well, yes. I was Grimsby. You were Hull at Viking, weren't you? Yeah. yeah. It but was, you came to Grimsby sometimes. So. Many times, yes. Yes, part of the, the Viking Radio heartland. Yes. And I would chop some voices together. I did an interview on Viking with Lenny Henry, who was doing a show at the whole new theatre. And quite naturally, we started just mucking about and playing with voices, just back and forth. And he said, oh, you should send a tape to Spitting Image. They're always looking for people. And I went, really? Oh, thank you for the advice. Right. Oh, jolly. So pretty much there and then I stayed behind and chopped some voices together of the time, mid-90s voices, Chris Eubank, Terry, Terry Christian off the words, you know, that kind of, yes, and Mr. Eubank, all of the well-known people of this period, you know. And I know that Steve Coogan had recently moved on from Spitting Image. And so eventually I got a chance to join the team. It was around about then that Alistair McGowan and, and I joined the uh, the roster of voice artists. And yeah, that was my first job on telly, Spitting wow. Image. And such great characters. I listened to a clip of you the other day talking about, I think you were talking about voice neighbours, which I'll get you yeah. to explain in a minute. But I think you were using Spitting Image as an example with Tony Blair and Julian Clary. And then I think actually you ended up in a bit of Victor Meldrew. But tell yes. me about voice neighbours and maybe you can use a bit of Spitting Image as a bit of an example of that. Exactly. We had to be very careful with it. Sometimes, you know, we, we call it voice neighbours when one voice, a tiny little pitch shift will take you into another voice, a totally different character but vocally related, as if they're the, the voice next door or the next station along. One of my great favourites, if you have Russell Crowe from his gladiator time, my name is Maximus Decimus Meridius. And if you go along with the Shakespearean tone and it accidentally laps into language, then Les Dawson comes back. <laughs> <laughs> Father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife. The Empress slaughtered all my neighbours, left me with the mother-in-law. How cruel is that? Etc. <laughs> <laughs> So the spitting image puppets were, because of the caricatures, the performances had to match the caricatures. So it could take you off to one direction or the other at certain times. So yes, we had to be quite careful that we didn't bleed into a similar character with a comparable vocal timbre, if you like. It was such a rich period though, wasn't it? In the world of entertainment as well, I would imagine there are a lot of people to take off in the 90s. Very different perhaps feel to now where it seems yeah. to be that our politics is providing some amusement, if only it weren't so serious. Yes, exactly. But I, th I think the, the celebrity side of things, you Julian Clares and people mm. like that, were very giving, weren't they, in those years for you guys, I would imagine. Yes, exactly. There was much less reality TV. There seemed to be fewer disposable celebrities in that sense, you know, those who come and go. People tended to stick around for a bit. And the characters of the 80s and 90s, they're still remembered now. Whereas today, characters may tend to come and go with a little bit more frequency. There's a greater sense of disposability. But yeah, these were stalwart characters, fixed, ever-present. What a great palette of spitting image they made. Wonderful. And I think really probably got William Hague to thank for thrusting you <laughs> further into the spotlight at the end of the 90s. Oh, goodness me. Yes, 1998. I was working with Steve Penk at Capital Radio at the time. Huge fun. Steve would bring me in to you know do a few voices and characters on his show. And Steve was known for doing these comedy phone calls. 
many he did himself, where he'd call someone up as a member from the council or uh, all of these inventive, wonderful things he'd do, sort of like Beatles about, but within a phone call. And uh, he gave me the chance to do a few character voices on some of these calls. And we'd speak maybe twice a week, you know, who are we going to do this week? Those sorts of chats. Well, there was one time I said, did you see that speech by the new leader of the Conservative Party? Uh, William Hay, what a great character he should be. We should feature him in one of your calls. And Steve always seeing the direct way through. He says, right, well, we've got to call Downing Street. We should call Downing Street. Really? Are you sure? <laughs> yep, that's what we do. That's what we do. Right, we'll call Downing Street. So, oh gosh, nervousness fills you up a little bit. And just on a little postcard, we were just writing some conversational possibilities. You know, the- Conversational possibilities <laughs> with Downing Street. Yeah. I like I like the way you slip that in very nonchalantly. <laughs> yes, exactly. It could go this way. If they say that, we'll say this. Then we'll answer with this, and then they'll probably say that, and they'll probably say, "Oh, go away, stop wasting our time." And then we can have a nice gag by replying, "Well, I'm the leader of the opposition. How dare you? Am I not important enough to be put through?" So, what happened? Did you get put through? Steve got the number of the cabinet office from directory inquiries. Oh, I remember that directory. <laughs> Yes. Did you look under C for cabinet office? I think so. Yeah. It was as simple as that. It was accessible as that. Maybe rightly so. And he typed the number in, thumbs up like that. He said, are you ready? I said, yep. I was behind the mic. Did you have butterflies? I had seagulls. <laughs> I had pteranodons. <laughs> I had stampeding ostriches. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the, hello, Downing Street. Oh, so it's uh, William Haig. Uh, I wonder if I could speak to Tony, please. Yes, just a moment. <laughs> uh, what? What? And Steve's jumping up and down on his swivel chair saying, she's gone to get him. She's gone to get him. Uh. So eventually... So um, you looked at your possibility of conversations. Yeah, and just threw those out. <laughs> I mean, that made something up. Yeah, well, I'm telling us everything all right. It's William Hay. Just sort of phone up for a chat. Everything okay? How are you? Don't work too hard. I'll speak to you at question time. That sort of thing. Oh, dear. And did you ever get any feedback from... Oh, we got quite a lot. Did yes. You, what was the feedback? Did you ever get any from, from William or from Tony? <laughs> <laughs> well, the first thing was Tony said, yeah, it's quite a good imitation. Because <laughs> I called him Tony. And Haig, with that sardonic sense of humour, always addressed him Prime Minister. Somebody pulled the plug on the call. Those who monitor the calls of the Prime Minister pulled the plug on it, which apparently Tony Blair was quite disappointed by because he was rather enjoying it. It rather brightened his morning. I'm sure it did. He mentioned it at Prime Minister's Questions that day. Uh, I took an interesting and detailed call from someone who'd managed to convince the Downing Street switchboard that they were the leader of the opposition. Oh, 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 order, order. <laughs> yes, did the uh, Prime Minister receive a call from someone claiming to be Chancellor of the Exchequer wanting a friendly chat? <laughs> and it went on. Then it was announced by Trevor MacDonald on the news that evening. And so, yes, it followed on like that. And then... <laughs> tabloid newspapers and everything like that. So you caused a kerfuffle, basically. We did. It was reported that Buckingham Palace was on high alert. <laughs> <laughs> so it was all rather, it was, it was only just us, you know, it was only just being a bit, you know, never t- intended a for it to, to be like that. Mm, you've got a very naughty twinkle in your eye, though, and that goes back to the Tom Baker. <laughs> Still not quite over that. Um, but do you get feedback ever? For example, do you know what Boris thinks of your interpretation of him? Do any of these people that you impersonate give you feedback or tips even? Yeah, some, sometimes they do. Chris Eubank once said, yes, I, I think um, maybe you exaggerate the lisp too much. I think maybe pull back. It's good for Nigel Ben. You, you've got the growl for Ben, but my teeth have been fixed and the lisp is a whistle. So bear that in mind. Yes, sometimes, yes, I remember having a, a conversation with William Haig. And I'd had to follow him doing an after dinner speech, which is a difficult thing to do because he's really, he's so supremely funny. So clever, yeah. So funny. But we were having a conversation about words that sound good when he says them. And yes, incorrigible, that's a favourite of mine, he said. <laughs> oh yes, of course, you've got Damascus and Benghazi. Oh, I know, I know, yes. Rory always reminds me about Benghazi. There are <laughs> <laughs> And what about royalty? Any feedback from royalty? You've got a wonderful word. It's not Prince Charles anymore, is yes. he King Charles? I remember being in a lineup for a Prince's Trust concert. And at the end was Camilla, who I was introduced to first. And the Prince Charles, as he was then, was about two or three people further back down the line up that way. And you know, rather like your mischievous auntie, she pointed and said, you do him. 
you know, you do him. I said, yes, well, I think that's sort of, one has to. <laughs> yes, good, good. <laughs> and he always seems, although he's been impersonated even since the Mike Yarwood days, it always seems to slightly surprise him still in quite a charming way. Because whenever I'm introduced to you or, or to Mr. Bremer, I can, I can sense that I'm being scrutinized. And there you are practicing your technique. Don't think this goes unnoticed. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's got a good sense of humour. And I hear yeah. that Camilla has a wonderfully wicked sense of humour. So I can imagine her egging you on a little oh, bit. Oh, yes, that. exactly that. When you're not taking off the stars, you're gazing at the stars. Ah. Do you like what I've done there? Yeah. You yes. love a little bit of astronomy, don't you? Yeah. What do you like about astronomy? And have you got a telescope? I have. I've got two. You've got two? I've got Tell two. me about I've your got... astronomy interest. I just think it's, it's the most... As Carl Sagan said, astronomy is a very humbling and character-building experience. I love the sense of infinity. I love the sense of how our knowledge really does end at a certain point when you try to take in the huge distances and enormous, unthinkable scale of astronomy, the distance and the size of the universe, the density of black holes whereby matter the size of a grain of salt could weigh as much as the Earth and how that shifts the gravity and space-time around it, and just all of these concepts and possibilities that take us away from our daily routine to a place of just jaw-dropping, awe-inspiringness. Very healthy to connect with that, and just to have the sense of possibility. Also the sense of the future, how it will be when human beings are a multi-planetary species. If we're able to, you know, terraform Mars, make it more Earth-like, the technology that we will have then, It'll have probably have helped us fix the Earth as well and just get the balance back there. And what will it be in, you know, 50,000 years from now, which astronomically is not a long time? Will we be a multi-planetary species? Will that have taken us to a, a greater level of thinking? And just the, the profoundness of all of that. It's good to let your mind just have a little stroll around that zone. You are a very deep thinker. I think um, I just drift off. You drift, you drift <laughs> off in the middle of anything, hey? yes. but it all kind of links back to the love of Doctor Who. I think infinite oh, yeah. possibilities. We are like tiny grains of sand, aren't we? Really yeah. on the planet, and you got me thinking deeper. It doesn't take much. <laughs> quite a shallow thinker, I think. Oh most of the no! Time. Carl Sagan said this lovely thing where we think about the universe, and it can make you feel small because the universe is infinite, and we're very small. But then the other side of that is that all the atoms in the stars and out there in the universe, they're part of the universe, but they're also part of us. We are made of matter from long since dead stars that gradually coalesced until eventually it became sentient beings. We are the way that the universe can understand itself. <sighs> Gone off again. Oh, that's amazing, isn't it? Well, you're a bit of Julian Clary, Tony Blair, and <laughs> a bit of Melju combined, aren't you? Quite a palette, do, yes. Do you, when you do your astronomy, do you mm. sort of gaze into the telescope and, and are you quite knowledgeable about when you're looking up into the, the night sky? Yes, a fair bit. I know enough to ask the experts sensible questions. <laughs> As opposed to me. I put it like doesn't. that. Oh, but to, to lead with your own curiosity, Patrick Moore always said that astronomy is for anybody and anyone can try it. And there's really nothing quite so marvellous as somebody experiencing it for the very first time. And because, uh, yes, as I always say, welcome to the universe, you'll never leave. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good place to wind up our lovely two-part special. I just want to say a massive thank you, John. I feel like I've been in a private show. <laughs> I feel like I may have exhausted you a bit. Oh, not and you've at been all. so generous with all your characters and voices and your deep thinking. And it makes me realise that we shouldn't leave it several years before we go to the opening of an envelope again <laughs> together, which is where we saw each other last. Yes, it doesn't feel like two years, does it? No, it, or it feels like just a few months or something like I know, that. A few months. We should get together. I will take you to Emily's show Looking in Soho. We'll go and yeah. see that. You have been listening to Tom Baker, John Pertwee, David Bowie, and a cast of thousands, courtesy of the wonderfully talented and thoroughly lovely Lancashire lad, John Colshaw. Do tune in to Dead Ringers on Radio 4 if you don't already. And if you're going to Edinburgh, there are two opportunities a day to see John in action. Download and subscribe to our series at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple and Google Podcasts or wherever you listen to yours. I'll leave you now with a message from His Majesty, King Charles. But I'd like to thank you very much indeed for listening into this really marvellous chat. And uh, Helen, I'd also like to thank you for um, having a very good natter over some splendid cups of coffee. It's been 
very therapeutic and centric. So they were very much indeed 